Michael was searching for a place to stay in New York as he was offered a new job in Brooklyn. He was feeling disheartened as the more places he searched, the more he felt he couldn't afford anywhere as there was no place that met his budget. But suddenly, when he was just about to give up, something caught his eye. He had to read it twice to make sure he wasn't imagining it. There was an apartment in a building in Brooklyn just a few blocks from where he was starting his job. He couldn't believe his luck, so he emailed the company right away, and a week later he moved in and was lying down on his bed smiling at the fact he had a place of his own in Brooklyn and was about to start a new job. He began to read a book and relax as he was starting work in a week. He was feeling tired and was about to go to sleep so he laid the book down beside him on the bed. Then he suddenly got a start when something like a shadow moved on the wall in front of him. He looked around expecting to see someone that made the shadow, but no one was there. No one was in the room. The shadows began moving around the room. He couldn't make any sense of them. Michael found it very hard to go to sleep that night, but eventually he slipped into a deep sleep. The next night the same thing happened. The next day he was walking down the street and past a street basketball court. He knew that the guys playing were looking at him strangely, so he asked could he help them. One guy said to Michael, you're that guy who moved into room 456 in the building right up the block, right? Michael was surprised these strangers knew and replied, Yes, how do you know that and why do you ask? The boy said, Man, did you hear anything about that place? There's weird stuff happens there, that's all I'm saying. Michael was thinking about the boy's words and instead of carrying on for his walk around the blocks like he usually did since he arrived in Brooklyn, he walked right back to his apartment. He opened his laptop and searched his address. He froze in horror when he saw a photo of a little boy and a man and woman on the screen. He guessed they were his parents. As he read on, he learned that the little boy was out playing one day when a Necronomicon book from H.P. Lovecraft was thrown out the window from stories above and hit the boy on the head. The boy suffered memory loss and trauma and was put into foster care and his parents were found in the apartment with their bodies mutilated. There was no evidence of anyone in the apartment and no conclusion as to what really happened the boy's parents. Michael heard of H.P. Lovecraft before and knew about his famous monster Kalulu. Then suddenly shivers ran up his spine as he thought of the shadows going up and down the wall many times since he arrived in the apartment. They reminded him of what Kalulu looks like that he saw down through the years. He remembered when he was a kid reading comics and the character was in loads of the pages in different forms of horror. Then suddenly Michael heard a noise and he screamed when he saw a weird looking monster in front of him which even though he couldn't believe his eyes knew that it had to be Kalulu. He screamed as the monster rushed for him and as he backed back more and more, Michael fell through the glass out the window and fell on the ground and was killed instantly. As he was falling to his death, his memory came back. 
It was always Kalulu who was making sure of Michael's fate. Michael got his job in Brooklyn and found the apartment and was drawn here by the spirit of Kalulu who hadn't finished him years ago. The curse only had power in the apartment. Just before he hit the ground, he had remembered. He was that little boy in the photograph. So many years ago, that got knocked unconscious by the Necronomicon being thrown from his apartment. Now the job is done, and now Michael is gone. I am afraid of what's lurking in the dark, yet I am afraid to put on the light. I just feel like standing here, waiting to the natural light come in when the morning comes. I can feel the evil all around me, it sends shivers up my spine. I am tired of standing so I will sit. I feel like sleeping, but I can't sleep. I feel tired, but at the same time, I feel wired. The light switch is there, right across the room from me. I could stand up and walk over any minute and leave this godforsaken room, open the door and just leave, and never come back. But I don't want to. I went from sitting down on the ground to lying down. I fell in between sleep and waking. I didn't want to fall asleep, as if I fell asleep, then what was in the dark could have all its own way. I could smell a horrible smell. I could feel a presence. The morning came. I was lying down as long as I could without opening my eyes. But I knew I eventually had to, and sure enough when I did, there were four of my friends lying in a pool of blood. I don't know what came over me, but I killed them all. I couldn't control myself. What will I do now? How can I live with this? Then I could hear something. I got a start. I looked out the window. There was a police car. I didn't expect to be caught so soon. Then I froze as the police came in and ignored me. Then I realized they weren't ignoring me. As I could see, there were more bodies on the ground than four. That's because the fifth one was the dead body of myself that lay there on the ground with my friends. Then it dawned on me about taking the tablets last night to overdose. They had worked. I was dead. Then something told me to look out the window and I saw four of my friends staring right at me. Tony was found dead inside his office by two police officers. If you ever wanted to be an armchair sleuth, here is your chance to see can you help the police by finding clues that will deter whether this scene is a suicide or murder scene. Take a good look around the room and see what you can spot to help you make your informed decision. Don't leave no stone uncovered 
be sure to look out for anything that can point you in the right direction of solving this case. Have you your answer ready? Let's see. Are your super sleuthing skills enough to help the police in cracking this case wide open? Is this a suicide or a murder? First, let's look at the clues. The man's cup seems to tell us he might be right-handed, so the gun on the left doesn't seem to be right for him to use his left hand. The place seems to be full of mess also, which means it seems like there was a struggle in the room. Also, if you took notice at the start of the video, there is a man running in the background outside the window. Could he be the perp? The evidence is pointing to it be a murder. On closer examination, the person outside the window was later identified as a jogger and there was a suicide note on the table. The police have ruled this crime scene as a suicide, especially when they have examined CCTV footage and no one entered the room or exited it between the hours it took place. Karen was driving down a dark country road just beside the woods. She was tired and wanted to just get home. As she was driving it felt like she was getting nowhere. She felt like she was falling asleep so much and she didn't want to and wanted to just keep driving and driving until she was at home and get into her own bed and fall fast asleep. She knew she had to stop to have a rest, so she parked her car. When she was stopped she went to open the door to get some fresh air, but she was locked in the car. Karen has a hammer. What way could Karen get out of the car when the door is locked? You can listen to some music while you try to come up with the answer and I'll be back in a very short moment to give you the answer and you can see are you correct. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed that music while you were considering how could Karen get out of the locked car with a hammer inside. Did you say she could break the window? She could, but then her dad would be mad that she wrecked his car window. She had realised that all she had to do was open the door, knowing car doors don't be locked from inside. It was her paranoia and tiredness made her think the door was locked. Picture the scenario. A woman shoots her husband, then holds him underwater. That evening the woman and her husband have dinner together. How is this possible, you might ask? This riddle you don't get to see the real crime scene, but from what I just told you, can you give me a rational answer as to how the couple went out for dinner together? I repeat, a woman shoots her husband, then holds him underwater. That evening the woman and her husband have dinner together. How is this possible? Once again, here is some music to you try to put your detective skills to work. I'll be back after this short music and give you the answer. And you can see, did you put your detective skills to good use?
You might wonder how can a man go for dinner with his wife after being shot and held under water, but did you listen to my words carefully? I clearly said that you don't get to see the real crime scene. What those words meant were that the woman shot her husband with her camera and held his photograph under water to develop in the dark room and then they happily went out for dinner together. So there is your answer. If you got it right, kudos to you, Columbo. Thanks for watching the Assassin Rapper, and if you enjoy the content, then make sure to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified of new content. Simon was walking down the street, ready to deliver a package to the local TV station. It was a 24-hour news network called Channel 6 News. He knew that he had to reach a huge audience, and he knew that when he broadcasted his statement, he had to do it before midnight on December 31st, 2020. He wasn't sure would it make any difference, but it was all he could do. He knew he had to try. He met the security guard and told him he had a package to deliver. The security man brought him into the office. Once inside, Simon took out his gun and pointed it at the security guard and said, OK, listen to me. I am not playing around. Take me to the main news broadcasting room. I want to go live before midnight. It is now 11 p.m., so I am not kidding. Take me there now. The security guard took Simon to the main room and said, I am so sorry, Miss Casey and Mr. Warren, but this guy said he was going to kill me if I didn't take him in here. He told me he wants to broadcast a statement. The presenters were stunned, as were the camera people in front of them and the people upstairs looking down from the control room. Simon said, OK, what the man said is true. I need to make a statement, live, and I need to make it soon. Mr. Warren said, Look, calm down, son. You can't just walk into a news station and demand to give a live statement. The second Simon walked into the room, they had cut to a commercial break, so no one was seeing what was happening. Simon held the gun to Mr. Warren's head and said, I am going to blow your bloody head off unless you get me on that bloody camera now to me give a live statement, and I don't want it on the lay, I want it to go out live. Mr. Warren tried to run and bring Miss Casey with him. Suddenly Simon got startled, and by accident his gun went off and shot Mr. Warren in his head. He shouted, look what she made me do. He ran over to the security officer and said, Get me live on air now. The security thought Simon was going to kill him, so he quickly got out his gun and pulled the trigger and shot Simon in his head. Simon fell dead on the ground. The police were called, and when an officer was searching his pocket, he found a piece of paper, which he thought must have been the script of the live statement he was talking about. It was midnight, he heard a strange sound, and people near the window shouted in amazement. He hadn't time to even read the first line of the statement, but he heard them shouting from upstairs. What the hell is that? He ran up to see what it was, and when he looked out the window, all he could see were UFOs all over the sky and the sky had turned red. He looked down at a piece of paper and read, I can't give this message online. They will find me that way. 
to only ways live on TV, they might still find me, but at least that way they won't be able to take it down straight away. I know that if I tried to mention it online, they would have words flagged to it be disrupted before I get the truth out. After midnight tonight, there will be an alien invasion. This was known for months, if not years, by the elite around the world. Some of the aliens are here already. They were here for a very long time. I don't exactly know how long. Tonight your president and elite government members around the world are sitting comfortable in underground bunkers. Those bastards did a deal with an alien race. It's a new world order. They're going to take over Earth. Humanity is going to be wiped out tonight. Besides those elite bastards. I don't know what is in it for the elite, but I overheard this information. If anyone knew what I knew, I would have been killed, but I am telling you tonight. With that there were beams beamed into the studio and everyone seemed to disappear. This was happening one by one. It seemed to the security guard that it took ages to the beam reach him. He thought to himself if the guy was allowed to give the statement, it might not have changed anything, but if people had known and had an underground bunker like those bunkers the doomsday prophecy people have had for years, then they would have a fighting chance. The beam landed on the security guard and he disappeared into thin air. Down in a bunker the president spoke. Well my friends. There is food and essentials for about a week. We were promised the air above will be clean in about five days. So we just have to suffer the boredom down here. But when we are above my friends, we will be in a much better world. We will be in a world that us and the reptilians can coexist in the open and not hidden like we have been for so long. Ireland is full of ghost stories, and one of the most famous of them all is the story of a ghost who returned to the living world with the sole intention of righting a wrong. What makes this ghost story so famous and memorable is because James Haddock was acknowledged and celebrated by the bishop of the time, Dr. Jeremy Taylor. This gave the story a very strong foundation to be passed down through the years as an Irish ghost story. James Haddock was a farmer who lived outside of Belfast. James died in the year 1657, but after his death, his spirit had returned to the land of the living to avenge those who did him wrong. James Haddock had made a will that those who should inherit his manor house and farm were his wife Arminel, his young son John Haddock, was to receive the rest of it once he reached the age of 21. Mr. Davis was the name of the executor of James's will. Davis married James's wife Arminel a few years after James's death. It was then was the start of the reason for James's spirit to start his haunting. As after James's death, Mr. Davis changed James's will where he put his own son as the beneficiary instead of John Haddock 
who was the rightful heir. Davis would have got his own way only for the haunting of James Haddock. It started one night during September. James's friend Francis Taverner was on his way home to Hilborough. Nothing was out of the ordinary until suddenly his horse stopped on the drum bridge near Brombeg. Taverner wondered what was wrong, but didn't think much of it, so just got off his horse and led him across the bridge. Suddenly he got a start when he saw a figure in a white coat appear right in front of him. Francis couldn't believe his eyes because the white figure in front of him looked exactly like his friend James Haddock who had passed away five years before. Francis was shocked to the core when the ghostly figure begged him to make sure his son was the rightful owner of the land that was due to him. Francis refused and jumped on his horse and raced away like a racehorse. Francis heard a very strong wind and screeches almost like a banshee when all of this was happening. Francis was happy to arrive home and as soon as he did he fell down on his knees and prayed to God to protect him from whatever he just saw. The next night Francis still wasn't over the shock of seeing his friend's ghost when he suddenly saw him again as he was sitting by the fire with his wife. He was disappointed his wife could not see the ghost and wondered why. James Haddock begged and pleaded with Francis that he has to go to his wife to persuade her to make sure his son gets what is due to him and what is rightfully his. He begged for him to make sure justice was done and to right the wrong. Francis once again refused to offer any help and due to it he was visited by James Haddock's ghost every single night for a month. Francis was in a very bad place and knew he had to get away from it all, so he fled to Belfast, but to his horror the ghost had followed him. He didn't know what to do. The ghost was getting more and more aggressive and was now demanding Francis go back to Arminal and punish her in the worst way for her terrible treatment of their son John. Francis was shocked and scared more than ever as the ghost warned him that if he didn't do what he was told there would be extreme measures taken. Francis Taverner knew he had to confide in someone and couldn't think of anyone else to go to for help besides his local chaplain. Francis explained the whole story from the very first time he saw the ghost on the bridge to the night before. When the chaplain was told not long after he had the whole story, he then went to visit Dr. Lewis Downs who was the vicar of Belfast at the time. The three men went to see Davis to explain the ghost's message and demand. Davis laughed at the men as if he was just told a very funny joke. He refused to make any change to the will and refused to give up any land. After none of what was done so far worked, the ghost of James Haddock had told Francis Taverner to take the matter to court. Francis knew that this would be farcical because one, they would laugh at the idea of a ghost and two, there was no witness. The ghost must have known Francis's worry. As he said, don't worry about them not believing you for I will appear myself in the court when you are the judge or whoever calls upon me, I shall appear. The court was held in Carrick Fergus and it was under the title, The Court Case, to return the estate to John Haddock. The opposing counsel mocked and jeered the idea and began to call for James's ghost to appear. He started shouting in a mocking tone, James Haddock, 
James Haddock. James Haddock. Under third mention of James's name, he received a ghostly, creepy, out of this world response. Reports circulated that then, in that very moment, there was a huge clap of thunder, and the courtroom shook as if there was an earthquake. And to make matters worse, a hand appeared in the witness box, and a voice from beyond this world asked, Is this enough? After that, the court case was settled almost immediately. Davis left the courthouse, where crowds of onlookers shouted abuse at him. He just wanted to go home, but he never did get home. The reason Davis never reached home is because as he was riding home, he was thrown violently from his horse and broke his neck. It was after this day Francis Taverner never saw the ghost of James Haddock again. The tale of the ghost and everything that came with it was the talk of the town and reached all corners of Ireland. It was then that Bishop Jeremy Taylor put it in writing that the ghost was true. The bishop said that James Haddock's ghost was the only ghost who ever answered a summons in the court of law. James Haddock was buried in Dronbeg Parish Church Courtyard in the 17th century. It is said throughout history that his tombstone will never ever stand up straight, even when it is moved upright, it just falls over. To this day it lies in moss and dirt, is the reason the tombstone doesn't stand upright. A message from James, is he trying to tell us something? Brenda and Tony were driving along the countryside on a December night. They were on a road trip for two weeks as a part of unwinding from a lot of hard work doing up their new house. The plan was to stay in several motels along the way and enjoy the road trip and eating out in diners and enjoying the scenery in between. It was just about getting dark when Brenda was surprised to see a hitchhiker on the road. She said to Tony, do you see that? Tony said, yeah, I wonder who is it way out here. The couple decided to stop and the hitchhiker said, hi there, my name is Paul. I would really love if you could give me a drive just a few miles up the road to the next motel, please. I took the wrong bus and I'm walking miles. Tony said, sure, hop in the back. The man's name was Peter. 
When he was in the back, he began to speak. I was sure happy to see you guys come along. I must have been walking for miles. I was about to drop unconscious with tiredness from all the walking. And believe me, I'm not fit enough to walk that long. But you guys, where are you from? Let me guess, the big city. Or maybe you're from the suburbs. Maybe you're the type of people that look down on folk like me. Brenda and Tony found that comment to be strange. Tony said, excuse me, why would we look down on you? Peter suddenly pulled out a gun and pointed it to Brenda's head and said, I'll tell you why you look down on me, because I've a gun held to your girlfriend, or is it your wife's head? And you're probably saying to yourself, I'm crazy. Tony said in a voice filled with fear and shock, what the hell man? Put away that gun, Peter said. I do the talking around here, now keep driving. Brenda began to feel around her pocket for her phone and pretended to sneeze to look down and press 911. When she did, she kept the phone on, hoping it would be traced. Tony said, look man, I don't know what's going on, okay? But I know that we did nothing to you, so please just put the gun away. Suddenly, Peter shouted, Stop the damn car. Brenda shouted, Please, no, please stop, just leave us alone. When the car stopped, Peter shot Tony in the back of his head, and he died instantly. The hitchhiker shouted to Brenda, You're lucky I'm not going to kill you, bitch. And he ran out of the car. Brenda picked the phone up and said to the 911 operator, Please help me, please, my husband has just been killed by some guy we picked up. Ten minutes later, the police arrived and took a statement from Brenda. Brenda was sitting inside her home that herself and Tony had recently refurbished. There was a noise at the door and a figure walked into the room. She could see that it was Peter the Hitchhiker. He pulled out a gun and pointed at her. Then he smiled and said, bang, bang. She smiled back at him and said, I have your money and thanks for taking this job. He actually was cheating on me all the while we were doing up our new home. Peter said, I actually must give you credit for this idea and coming up with the 911 call, etc. But as much as I'd love to stay around for tea, I need to get going because if your police or neighbours see me, then who knows, tongues might start wagging and they might ask questions. Brenda asked, what do you mean? How will they trace you to all this? They never even saw your face. Peter said, I know, but I still have to tie up loose ends. Brenda said, what do you mean? Peter said, don't worry, it will be over soon. He lifted the gun and shot Brenda in her head. Then he walked into her bedroom and opened up her safe with her own finger he cut off just a minute ago. He was going to just go ahead and murder her husband for $100,000, but she had too much a big mouth and told him about a safe full of diamonds that only her fingerprint would open. He smiled when he looked at all the diamonds. Then suddenly he heard a ticking sound. He wondered what it was. He looked around the room to see. Suddenly all the doors and windows locked. He assumed it was some sort of alarm from the safe being opened at a time that wasn't scheduled. He heard the ticking get louder as he looked under the bed and saw that it was a bomb. From the timer he saw that it would detonate in 10 minutes. For the next 10 minutes, he looked around for a way out of the house. But when the 10th minute came, he exploded with the house.
Joe was a therapist that saw lots of different patients with different problems, but little did he know that one of his patients would create a huge problem for him. Joe was having an affair with a lady called Lucy, but unluckily for Joe, one of his patients, Tom, spotted them kissing on the street one night. Joe was kicking himself how stupid he was, but his patient Tom would not give up on it. He knew he would not give up, ever, until he got what he wanted. He knew that was his MO. Joe worried about it a lot, until one session Joe had a plan. Tom had threatened Joe he would tell his wife about the affair, and Joe knew he wasn't kidding. But Joe came up with a plan that he knew would work. Joe said to Tom, OK Tom, I know that I've been sitting here telling you for months about you having to control your urges, and I know that you have some crazy fantasies that would get most people locked up in prison, but I have an idea for you. I created a plan that you could live out one of your fantasies that you were always talking about. This fantasy, Tom, is what I'm talking about. This fantasy would get you locked up, and I mean locked up for a very long time. But what I'm getting at, Tom, is I can make this happen for you. I can make this fantasy become a reality with no repercussions. Tom gave Joe a curious look, wondering what he was about to say. Then he said, what is this plan of yours, may I ask? Joe took a breath and said, OK, well I never gave in to one of my wife's fantasies, for the simple fact I know this might sound hypocritical when I'm a cheater myself, but I would never want my wife to sleep with another man. However, it is one of her fantasies to a stranger walk into her bedroom in the middle of the night and have sex with her. Now, what I am offering you is that chance to you be that stranger to walk in and have sex with my wife. But only if you promise me you won't breed a word of my affair to her, and don't ever breed a word to her or anyone else. Tom sat back smiling, then said, Now, I must say, that sounds like a plan. Joe and Tom spoke for another 15 minutes, organising to him call over tomorrow night. He gave his address and time. The next session Joe was feeling a lot better as he knew Tom loved the plan, and he had promised not to tell his wife. Now that he is giving him the chance of having sex with her, Lisa was Joe's next patient. She was beaten by her husband for months before she finally had the opportunity to leave him. Joe asked how things were going. Lisa said, I am so jumpy at everything. I can't even walk down the street without thinking my husband is following me. It's got so bad I sleep with a loaded gun. The next day Tom was happy about what was going to happen tonight. He smiled at the fact of him getting the chance to sleep with his therapist's wife. It all felt so exciting to him, a stranger walking into her room in the dark and having sex. That night he drove over to Joe's house. The door was open and he walked up the stairs to the room where Joe told him his wife would be. It was exactly 1am and Joe told him he would be gone out for a walk. Tom walked up to the bed and could see Joe's wife lying there. He wondered was she pretending to be asleep or was she really? He kneeled down next to her, about to kiss her, when her eyes opened and she screamed. She reached for her gun and shot Tom in the head. Joe looked out from his car across the street smiling, knowing that Tom will be no more problem to him, and he drove off proud of himself for giving Tom the address 
of his patient Lucy, who he knew had a gun, right there beside her bed. He smiled, wondering, did she not realize she tells him every single session about having a gun by her bed? He knew she would blow Tom's head off instantly once she knew a stranger was in her house. Joe drove home and snuck back into bed. He was hoping his wife wouldn't wake up. Luckily for him, she didn't. He didn't want to have to explain anything. He was looking forward to the morning to tell his darling wife how much he loved her. Jessie and her friend Kayla were at home watching a horror movie when they started talking about the local legend Slenderman. Jessie was saying, Slenderman is real, he isn't just a made up character. Kayla said, do you really expect me to believe you that a 10 foot 10 man is real and you have seen him? Why didn't you take a photo of him with your phone then? Jesse was getting annoyed and gave Kayla an angry look and said, Okay, you don't believe me? Well, I can take you to the woods tomorrow to meet a friend of mine which will prove Slenderman is real. Kayla replied, Okay, you're on. The next night, Jesse and Kayla went out to the woods. They were walking down the woods when they saw a box with first clue written on it. Jesse asked Kayla to see what was inside. Kayla said, I suppose you think I'm afraid to open it. Then she opened it and retrieved a map where to go looking for the next clue. As they walked about 10 minutes deep into the woods, they came across the next clue, which was another box. Kayla opened it again and there was a map which apparently would lead them to the proof of Slenderman. As they walked towards where the map led them, there was a very high tree with a box hanging from it saying proof. Kaylee said to Jesse, there's no way I'm climbing that tree. Jesse said, turn around and close your eyes for five seconds. Then you can turn back around again and open them. Kayla said, what are you playing at? Jessie said, losing her patience. Do you want you to see the proof of Slenderman or not? Kayla turned around and counted to five. One, two, three, four, five. When she turned back, Jessie had the box next to her on the ground. Kayla asked her, how did you climb way up there so fast? And what about this friend of yours you promised you'd show me? Where is he or she? Show me the proof of Slenderman being real. You told me your friend would show me the proof of Slenderman being real. How long do I have to wait to see the proof? Let me answer your first question first and the second after, Jesse said. First, I didn't climb the tree. And the answer to your second question is, my friend is over there, and he is the one who picked the box from the tree. Jesse pointed over towards the trees, and Kayla screamed when she saw the slender man.
Thanks for watching the Assassin Rapper, and if you enjoy the content then make sure to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified of new content.